America, my name is Ayumi Ose Frimpong, and you're watching the third episode of The Black Athenians. And today we're going to talk about downward mobility. Now, before we get started, because once I get started, I'm not going to stop, not going to stop till the end. I'm going to need you to go to your social media account and... Um, Matthew, that my, my account's up, so just go ahead and put this on my page also. Uh, go to your social media account, share this video, like this video, and now tweet the video out there because I'm gonna tell you why black people, your kids, are not doing as well as um, you thought they were. You know, you, you thought they were gonna grow up to be Huxtables. Or well, at least like the family on rock. They had a nice house. But instead your kid lives with you and you're like, well, you know, I was a good parent. I did what I was supposed to do. I, I you know, I, I went out of my way to make sure that my child um, was going to be a, a strong, stable, adult um, American. But it turns out that, that, that your, your child uh, isn't doing that well. And the question is, is it their moral failure in black people? we do tend to blame ourselves for things that are not our fault. First of all, I want to be very clear. Our problems are political. So anybody who goes around blaming black people for black people being broke, even your adult children being broke, that's, 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 that's inappropriate. We have to look at systemic failure. There's a, there's a disjunct. Either you're going to start blaming black people or for being broke, or you blame a system that terrorized us in our communities for, for black generational poverty. I, I fall squarely on the side of systemic failure that has yet to be redressed. Look, in the 30s when white people were broke, we designed an entire new deal um, to build white wealth. And since that, deal was, since that new deal was designed largely by Southern Democrats, uh, that New Deal was designed to exclude black people from white wealth. Uh, you know, probably in a few weeks, I'm going to do an entire show on just how the New Deal excluded um, the building of black wealth while it was integral to, to building white wealth in, in the United States. So we're broke. It's not your fault. It's not your kid's fault. All right, so I'll be honest. If you're a baby boomer with a little bit of money and, and, and stability throughout the 80s and 90s, it's a little bit your fault. It's just a little bit your fault. You didn't know any better. A lot of baby boomers got divorced for similar reasons. You, didn't, you just didn't know any better. Turns out there are generational consequences. I'm going to explain that too, but like, don't blame your kids um, because this world is very complicated. So share, and we're going to... Uh, Share this video, like this video, tell your friends. We're gonna break it down why your black adult child is not doing as well as you thought they were going to do. Um, you thought you were gonna raise a Huxtable and not Denise, you know, you know, one of the, Sandra. You thought you were gonna raise Sandra Huxtable and somehow you ended up with JJ from Good Times and that's it's just not, it's just not. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Um, I have a studio audience here um, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna get going. All right, so to be black in America is to to be a bit of a deer in a forest, um, full of real predators like lions. And why is that the case? And don't get it fooled. You're not a lion. Real lions know that you're not a lion. And um, somehow we have an economy where black people are deers in a forest, and the only job is helping lions feed on other black people. And that's not appropriate. Um, that's not appropriate. And that's not the way to build uh, a community, a class, a black middle class. And by the way, if anybody asks, what's Army doing over there at the Black Athenians? There's only one thing I'm doing. I'm trying to build a black middle class. I want black people, not like a black person. I want black people at $25, $30, $35 an hour jobs. Um, I want black people as hiring managers. Uh, at local large institutions, and I want black people as entrepreneurs and, and contractors who are getting the contracts. So that's the goal. I want to build a black middle class, not exceptions to the rule. I want to change the rule, and I'm convinced that politics is how you change the rules, because any strategy that's non-political is, is a strategy 
that's geared towards building black exceptional people. And you shouldn't have to be exceptional to, to be an American. You shouldn't have to be an exceptional to have a job where you have two weeks vacation and a little bit of freedom. Uh, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be exceptional to have a salary. So I want to build a black middle class so that you do not have to be exceptional. If you want to learn how to be an exceptional black person, that's, I don't know, that's just not what I'm doing here. If you want to learn how we're going to build together uh, whole black neighborhoods and communities that are middle class, then that's what we're trying to do here. And the way you change the odds instead of beat the odds, the way you change the odds is through politics. Right? So the political work we're going to do here is to explain to you why you tried to raise an exceptional child and it turns out that your non-exceptional child still isn't doing all that well. Or even your exceptional child, your very smart exceptional child, is still like because you intentionally like move to the right neighborhoods to get them in the right schools and get them the right opportunities, they're still not doing that well because they're black. They're black and of a certain age and a window closed politically that shut them out of quite a few opportunities. Now there is a First of all, before we get going, I have to tell you that this entire show is made possible by the work of Broderick Flanagan Studios. Broderick Flanagan is a portrait artist based in Athens, Georgia. And if you ever need a mural painted in your backyard, in a public building, in a public space, just Google Broderick Flanagan Studios and uh, shoot him an email or send him a call and he'll give you a very reasonable price. Also... Um, Broderick Flanagan is a business consultant. So if you ever look around your business, and there are quite a few white businesses in, and I'll say white businesses because all your people are white, in Athens, Georgia, and around town that could use black subcontractors for all manners of contracting and subcontracting. If you need, your, uh, if you need new floors done, if you need your roofs, if you need your gutters done, if you need a black plumber, if you need a black handyman, if you need a black person to do your uh, to carpet cleaning, all of that subcontracting work, if you're working for an, uh, an office, either downtown with the university or with the hospitals or in any of the businesses around, those contractors could be black. And the person to hook you up with those black contractors so you, so you feel good at night when you sleep. And also so that you know you're doing some sort of justice, although you might have been screwing it up for the last, you know, however long your business has been doing. You could do some sort of justice going here forward. You talk to Broderick Flanagan. He's, um, he'll work with both the businesses who are going to contract with you and with you to make sure you get black contractors. So. None of this is possible without Broderick Flanagan's uh, studios. If you need any business and you want black businesses in town to actually get some of the money you've been throwing around to Watkinsville or Winder, then talk to Broderick Flanagan about that. Now, um, why your kid isn't doing that well goes down to black vulnerability. Now, there's a report that came out from... Uh, demo, so Think Tank based in Washington, run by Heather McGee. She's actually doing very good work over there. So like, I'm, I have a very complicated relationship with Washington-based think tanks, but Demos, head, headed by Heather McGee, is actually doing interesting work. They did a study called The Asset Value of Whiteness. And Matthew, if you can track down that study and, and, and put down, um, uh, put, it, put it over my shoulder or something. I'll scoot over. So I'll give you good shoulder room to do that. So there's a, there's a study called The Asset Value of Whiteness. And in this study, um, it, and what it, what's an asset? You know, I just got to meet people where they're at. Assets is something you have that can make you money. Something that you have that you can leverage to make money. For example, the um, computer equipment and the, the studio equipment and the, and the cameras and the microphone, those are all assets insofar as I'm going to tell you right now, if you like anything I'm doing, you go over to thefunkyacademic.com. There's a panel on your left that will allow you to become a monthly member that will help us uh, grow and market this program for black politics, which eventually is going to make a black middle class all across these United States. Because if it could work in Athens, Georgia, it could work in Mobile, it could work in Savannah, it could work in Gainesville. It might even be able to work in St. Louis. I know it's popping off right there right now. Um, it can definitely work in Richmond. 
Virginia. Uh, anywhere there's poor black people but a lot of white money, a black politics will redistribute those goods uh, in a way that's in accordance with justice. Because we're not poor by accident, we're poor for reasons. And largely we're poor because we've spent a lot of our time in the United States making white capital through the cotton economy and, and other, um, and other uh, industrial endeavors. So there's uh, a report that's released by Demos called The Asset Value of Whiteness. And it shows that just being white makes money. It makes everything else make money. It's actually a money multiplier. So your degree is worth more if it's like a degree plus whiteness. And your house is worth more if it's a house plus whiteness. And your, um, your degree, your family is worth more if it's um, a family plus whiteness. So if you can throw up, the, there's, a, there's, an, there's a, a graph that shows that What's the graph you have right now? Is this the one about families? Yeah. All right. So if you have a family, um, if you're married, your wealth, if you're married and black and you have a household, you're, you still have less wealth than a single um, white person. All right. And that's just, that's, these are median numbers. And medians, if you know, medians just means the middle. There's as many above as there are below. So if you throw a rock... That's just what you'll hit. And this number says that even if you're married in your household, your household, your married household has less wealth than a white single household. Right? And what does that mean? That means that all the stories that people have told you about the reason that you're broke is because like, you screwed up um, uh, in your domestic relationships and you should have gotten married at the right age and should have stayed with somebody or whatever. That's just not true you could have been white and, and, and done just fine because there's an asset value to whiteness. So if you're single and you're white, money still finds a way to find you in a way that if you're single and you're black, money just doesn't find you. It just doesn't find you. It actually is repelled from you. It's, it's like, um, and that matters. And that matters insofar as you want to start a business because that means it's harder to start a business. It's harder to get capitalized. And that's not because you weren't married. And that's not because there weren't two incomes. It's because you're black in a nation that's made a policy out of starving out black people. And it's made other policies, multiple policies, of growing white wealth. Right? So people say, like, all right, so black people are poor because they screwed up in the, in the family arrangement. It's not true. According to this graph. Go ahead and put this full screen for a second. Um, and once again, this is... Uh, the asset, uh, the um, asset value of whiteness is the name of the is the name of the study, All right? So your problem isn't that you're single with children. The problem is that you're not white in an America that gives a lot of political support to white people. So I right, take it down and give me the other one about. There's a graph about education. Um, not that one. There's a graph. All right. So, and look on the thumb drive. It might be there too if, if you don't find it. All right. So, there's a graph uh, that Matthew's tracking down that says actually your education plus degree means more than just your degree. So, what that means is if you're white and you dropped out of high school, you still have a more wealth than a black person who went to college. Right? So I'll say that again. If you're white and you dropped out of high school, you still have more wealth than a black person who went to college. And that means the myth that, like, you know, if you just stayed in school, you would have done fine. Actually, if you're black, that, mean, that often means loans. Right? And if you're white, you know, that's just four more years of working and being white and maybe working on a construction job and then eventually becoming a contractor in that construction job. And so it, the, the college degree doesn't do what we say it does for black people. Uh, insofar as our also in the same report, it will show that the loan rate is higher. I think it was, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to guess the numbers. Just once again, go to uh, 
the asset value of whiteness. And if you want the, the study that actually provoked this show, you can go to um, Brookings Institute. The Brookings Institute released a report that said that seven out of 10 children born in black middle class families are falling into poverty, are going to fall into poverty. Once again, that's seven out of 10 black middle class families are going to fall into poverty. Right? And in Athens, Georgia, I heard a report that 4%, only 4% of children, black children born, into, or children born into poverty, and in Athens, Georgia, the kind of poverty I'm talking about is black poverty, um, make it to the middle class. So if you ask why black children in Athens are in anywhere dropping out of school, it's because, look, if the only chance you have is one out of 20, why even bother? Or if you become one out of the 20, then you've left everyone around you behind. So you're either alone or alone and alienated, or like why even bother because it's not going to work anyway. You're going to be broke because you come from broke people in a town that really likes old money and old connections that are usually attached to old money. You'll still find a job because unemployment in Athens is only about 5%, which means that there are a lot of people making six, seven dollars an hour working poverty wages who look like us. Uh, but you'll never move to the middle class because if you don't know, and people with money know this, people who don't know with people without money uh, have this a little bit confused. You don't make money by saving, you make money by leveraging it. Right? What does that mean? You make money by leveraging, you make money by turning money into money. Uh, that means either starting a business, investing, buying property, that turning your property into an asset. If you just save, and black saving rates at the lower incomes, which are most black people, are actually higher than white savings rates at those incomes. And um, so we save fine. The problem is you don't make money by saving money. You make money by, being, by having it involved in the multiplication of capital in America. And that multiplication is determined by a white politics and a white power structure. Right. So anyone who says that you can make money by saving it in America is just is not, is not telling you the truth. Unless you already have a lot of money. Right? So if you're poor and you think you can make you can become middle class by saving money, that's just not how America works. If you're already middle and upper class and you think you can stay there by saving money, then yeah, it, you know, depending on, on how much your net worth is, you can do that. But if you're poor and you want to move from poverty to middle class by saving pennies in an America that's, that's growing um, and, and faster than, than, than one and two percent, then, then it's just not ever going to work. Your children are going to be poor. So we need a politics that actually moves the wealth generating apparatus into the black community. Because right now, it's actually incredibly poor. To, I mean, it, it's incredibly expensive to be poor and black. Because if you're poor and black, you usually live around other poor and black people. And there's a study, a great book called, uh, called The Color of Money, um, written by Mersha Barad, uh, Baradan. And she's going to be here with me next week, and we're going to talk about it. And it shows in this book, once again, it's called The Color of Money. It should be floating around on, on the USB somewhere. Or maybe you, you grab a screenshot of it. Um, Mersha argues that very well that studies have shown that $100 spent in a white community, you need $300 to get those same goods and services in a black community because of the credit market, everything's just more expensive in a black community. Everything is simply more expensive in a black community. And this is because of policies that have been organized to starve black communities of both credit and access to like wealth. So we know that education doesn't do for black people what it does with white, for white people. We know that um, property doesn't do for black people what it does for white people. Because if you're black and you're living in a black neighborhood, any neighborhood that's more than 10% black pays a tax or starts paying a tax. Um, and any neighborhood that's less than 10% black and is actually all mostly white starts getting a white appreciation value. So there's a bonus for living around white people if you're um, 
white, and there's a penalty for living around black people, more than 10% black people. And I suspect um, schools are similarly blessed. So what does that mean that we have a real estate market? And the real estate market was contrived. Once again, I can do a whole show on the FHA and how the FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, um, that was the New Deal program, was contrived to grow white suburban wealth by deeming um, integrated neighborhoods unharmoniously, un, unharmoni uh, inharmonious, inharmonious, so that they wouldn't back loans given to neighborhoods that were diverse, um, or actually just black neighborhoods. So it ended up growing new white wealth and incentivizing uh, real estate agents and the consumers if they wanted to protect the asset value of their house to lock out black people. Or if more than 10% of black people came into the neighborhood, it incentivizes white people to move out, which then um, allowed the housing values to disproportionately plummet relative to the neighborhoods that they went to where the housing values disproportionately went up. And these are all political projects. And we've, we, if we had a string of policies to grow white wealth and grow black poverty, we can have a string of policies that will grow black wealth. And honestly, it'll make some people who are living in that white bubble a little bit nervous because it's going to make your housing go down a little bit. Let's go. It's okay, though, because we're actually going to make a black middle class, so you'll be able to, instead of sending your kids to a white private school, you'll be able to send them to public school or, um, because test scores will are tied to income and with like a, a black middle class, I mean, black incomes are going to go up, which means that you'll, um, you won't have to pay so much for your anti-black racism. So you're welcome. Let's go on. All right, so why, are, why black people, why aren't your adult children doing as well as you thought they would when you thought they were going to be Sandra Huxtable and they're turning out more like Denise or Theo? Or let's be honest, they're turning out more like JJ from Good Times. Um, and I actually like good times. I would like very much if anyone has access to the kind of resources that allow me to produce a new good times, I would write an excellent good time centered around Michael, and it would be fantastic. Michael would be a, a laid off school teacher, and like, it would just be about the neighborhood. We can cast folks. Um, it would be fantastic. Uh, it would be a wonderful good time about black life. And it would not pull punches. And it would just be honest about like, black generational poverty and how that ain't our fault. It was those easy credit and ripoffs that left people scratching and surviving. So. <laughs> yeah, the good, yeah, yeah, it, it took a while for, for people to get that. I was like, what are the other lyrics? Um, I actually liked what's happening, too. So that, that, that's just me. Um, so, your kid, you told them to go to college and take out loans. Now they have loans, but college was a key. And, but since the labor market still disproportionately locks out black people, your kid hasn't found that job you thought that they were going to find. Um, so they went to college, they did what they were supposed to, and ended up with debt and no job, or not that they're underemployed. Right? They're, not looking, they're not working at the, the places that, they're, the, the, that you thought that they were going to work. So they're, they're living with you. They're underemployed. And you, it turns out that your, their connections can't get them their hookup job. Because you can be, I know a lot of white people, white people, I know a lot of you. And I know that not all of you are as smart as you pretend to be when uh, you get that hookup job by someone at your church, someone who was a fraternity brother of your father, someone who was a family friend or in the same club as your mom, like that got you a good forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year job uh, once you were done finding yourself. And now, and now, uh, you know, it, it paid for a down payment on a house, so you're like, well, you know, I, I did well. Why didn't you do well? There's a clip I have. I'm going to track it down. 
Uh, and this one I think is a fascinating clip for a few reasons. Give me a second to find it. Um, I don't want to give away the lead. Is there a clip that says persistence of wealth? Yes. All right, so this is a clip that's on the persistence of wealth. And this is funny, and it's timely, because this is actually a clip, an interview from the shooter, the shooter's brother from the Las Vegas shooter. This is a fascinating clip on the persistence of white wealth. And remember, this guy, is, he's going, he has a lot of feelings because his brother just mowed down uh, uh, quite a few people in Las Vegas, and this is the next morning. And this is what we find out about the, sh the Las Vegas shooter. My mom was born in the Depression. She's had a tough life. Her husband was an asshole, a total asshole. He ran off, left her with four kids. She raised four kids on a secretary salary in the, seven, you know, in the 60s and 70s. And some of us weren't real good kids. I mean, you guys are probably going to investigate me. I wasn't a wonderful human being when I was a kid. We were bad kids. Okay? That's, you know, at some level. We were troublesome kids. We were, grew up poor on the side of the freeway in the San Fernando Valley in California. I, I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to go too much into this, but if, to how we were formed. I, we're just people. The, my mom has had a tough life. And here's where it goes in, where it branches into Steve, the Steve that we knew. Steve made my mom wealthy. He, he's the one, he's the reason why she's, he's, it's not, he's not the only reason. She did this herself, a lot of it, okay? But he helped make her retirement very comfortable. You know, he's the reason she's very, very comfortable right now. She wouldn't have been as comfortable because you don't make much money as a secretary in the 70s, raising four kids, okay? Steve is the reason that she has substantial, that she has substantial funds right now and is comfortable. That's the Steve I, that's the Steve I know, okay? Now, the other thing is the, I, someone said that Mary, that, that Steve transferred $100,000. Woo, $100,000. We're, we're wealthy people. $100,000 isn't that much money, A, and I'm sorry if that hurts people or something, but $100,000 isn't that huge amount of money. He gambled that much through a machine in hours. I mean, we're, once again, you need to understand. That's what people need to understand, the level where some people live. I guess everybody thinks that everybody works at Taco Bell or something. Everybody doesn't work at Taco Bell. There's wealthy people who do this. Yeah, he, uh, Mary Lou, I'm sorry. Okay. Steve took care of the people he loved. He helped make me and my family wealthy. <laughs> I mean, he's the reason I was able to retire three years ago when I got really burnt out doing the job I did. My mom was born in the Depression. She's had a So, let's be honest. First of all, there are a few things. Someone in the comments actually said this right. If, you were, if this family were black, like, they'd be in jail. Three out of those four, four boys would have already served time. Um, and the fourth one would just be working a job. Second, we need to understand the persistence of white wealth. What that means is one Steve can, like, stabilize an entire clan. What that means is one Steve can stabilize an entire clan. And that means if that kid, Steve left a lot of money, and I don't think they, they take money after you're dead, which means there's going to be a will, which means that if any one of Steve's nephews or nieces needs to start a business, needs $50,000 to start a business, because um, that's how much it, it costs to actually start a business. It's more than just you know, a few hundred dollars for paperwork and business cards. You actually need about $50,000 if you want to market and start a business and actually get in the game. Um, unless you have like a lot of connections. So if any of our C's nieces or nephews need $50,000 to start a business, there's a trust fund for them. You don't think Steve, start, you, you don't think Steve who cares about his family already hid the money in a way that is going to take care of the nieces and nephews in that family? So, 
Steve's nieces and nephews can start a business, can fail, learn by failing, and start a new business with another round of $50,000. And that's how you win in America. That's how you win in America. Also, there, I'm sure there's lots of property involved that looks like a very nice house in, in Orlando. Um, and I'm sure that's not the only one that Steve bought for grandma, because now the money's in grandma's name, and it's in his brother's name. So all of Steve's money is still circulating around white, the white community. So the idea that you need to be like super morally appropriate to make money in America is just not true. It's never been true, but it's more, it's more true now because there's actual penalty. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. First of all, eventually, if you like what I'm doing, if you like anything I'm saying, go over to thefunkyacademic.com, sign up for a monthly. Eventually, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to have to hit you up because we're growing here at the, the live show. I'm going to have to hit you up for a lot of money so that I can buy a studio. The idea of doing this show out of someone else's space isn't really working out, so that's why we've had to move a few spaces a few times. Um, but I'm committed to doing a live show. I'm committed to doing a live show in Athens. But it's going to take us buying a space through the show, or buying a studio, because if you don't own it, it's going to be um, a, a black politics show that accommodates the white landlord. And that can't ever be the quality of black politics that we need. That's why we've had to move the show um, uh, a, a few times. Uh, because black people, insofar as we do not have the wealth that, um, that goes into buying property, the black people who would allow me to do this have to worry about their white check. Like, so any black person with money still has to worry, not any, but most black people with money still have to worry about a white boss. Whereas, like, you know, Richard Spencer in the alt-right doesn't have to worry about a white, well, he doesn't have to worry about a boss who might, who might, uh, who might curtail his message. Um, so like, it's coming, it's coming, and we're gonna need to buy a space to do this studio because all I want is for black people to get their cut of the capital that's generated by America. I'm not looking for black hegemony or, or black supremacy. I just want black political power, which gives black people their cut. For example, Athens has about a, north of uh, $8.4 billion uh, GDP and a 30% black population. That means 30% of those $8.4 billion should find its way into black hands if we're doing our job right. And the reason 30% of that $8.4 billion doesn't flow its way into black hands, and the reason why you can't just buy your kid a house and why your kid has to live with you is because we've been locked out. And if you want more about how that locked out work, Go back to my last show on the history of white terrorism in Athens, Georgia. And if it happened in Athens, that means it happened in Richmond, and it happened in Mobile, and it happened in Columbia, and it happened in Columbus. So, um, right now, the best way to get money as a black person is to cozy up to a white check. And I'm gonna have I'm gonna play a short clip from Malcolm X, um, and and show you, and I think that'll show you the vulnerability and why you might have made a strategic mistake in raising your child. All right, so here is the clip. There was two kinds of slaves. There was the house Negro and the field Negro. The house Negro they lived in the house with master. They dressed pretty good. They good because they ate his food what he left <laughs> they lived in the attic or the basement but still they lived near their master and they loved their master more than the master loved himself they would they would give their life to save their master's house quicker than the master would the house negro if the master said we got a good house here the house negro said yeah we got a good house here <laughs> whenever the master said we he said we that's how you can tell a house Negro. If the, master's, if the master's house caught on fire, the house Negro would fight harder to put the blaze out than the master would. If the master got sick, the house Negro would say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. We sick.
He identified himself with his master more than his master identified with himself. There was two kinds of slaves. So the idea that respectability, respectability politics goes right to reproducing House Negroes. I'll say that again. Respectability politics goes right to reproducing House Negroes. The way to make it in America right now, uh, since honestly, they don't need field Negroes anymore. Uh, so many of your baby boomer parents and baby boomers, if you're watching, many of you thought the way that your child was going to succeed was by treating them, was by telling them to be house Negroes. Um, the problem is, it was never going to work. It was never going to work. Now, there's a lot of terrorism that goes, and like, you're like, well, you know, if you identify with the master, if you just like, uh, pretend that we have a shared fate, um, then, then, then you won't get lynched. And, and you'll, be, you'll be fine. Like, so I'm just, I'm doing, as a matter of safety, pretend that you are, um, that like you identify with the master and you have a shared fate. When you don't have a shape, shared fate, put up the Edward Wolf clip. Actually north of, of $100,000, it's about 116 with those same adjustments. Um, that means there isn't a shared fate. And honestly, that means that the $116,000, $100,000 was made by extorting wealth and labor from black people to make us have uh, $1,700. So, right? So, how ridiculous is it? Is it? Um, the idea that we, um, uh, and put it big, all right? So, If there was a shared fate, if we had a shared fate with white America, wealth disparities would not look like this. This is not a shared fate. This is what happens when you don't have a shared fate. When the median black household is worth $1,700 with a handful of adjustments, um, and the median white household is actually we have a shared fate. And you can take away the, the graphic. Uh, how ridiculous is it to, 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 to further the idea of we had a shared fate when there's such discrepancy, and there's always been such a discrepancy, and the discrepancy is getting bigger, not smaller, as black people actually start becoming, especially black men, start becoming a disposable population um, in the United States. So we were taught to be house Negroes, because remember what Malcolm X just said. Now listen, listen to your first black president. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There are a few things. There are a few things he, he, he made a mistake. It turns out there is a liberal America and a conservative America, because I don't think liberal America elected our current president. That was a very famous speech he made in 2004. It was a speech he made to America that says, like, I am a House Negro who will create more House Negroes. And that's a speech that got him elected, and it was a wonderful speech, because he just said, there is no difference. We's all the same. When master's sick, I'm sick. When the Democrats are sick, Black people were sick. So I'm going to bring up a string of um, clips. Uh, so I'm going to show, give me, give me the San Francisco um, jail. All right, good. So Nancy Pelosi is the House leader of the Democrats. And um, she's supposed to be one of the highest ranking Democrats in the United States. And, and when she's sick, all black people are sick because we, vote, we give Democrats 90% of their, our votes. The problem is uh, Nancy Pelosi is from San Francisco, and black people in San Francisco are sick, but Nancy Pelosi is doing fine. This, this article shows that black, black people represent six. I think that number has gone down since the article has been printed. 6% um, of the city. I think it's closer to four, three or four right now. And also 56% of the inmates. So the question is, in jail. When, Nan when we're sick in San Francisco, is Nancy Pelosi sick? Now give me the other picture of Nancy Pelosi. Um, 
The question is, when black people are sick, is Nancy Pelosi sick? Does she look, like, does she look sick to you? Uh, I don't think so. I think when black people are sick, Nancy Pelosi's fine. And that's in her city. So we have to think about our relationship with the Democratic Party. I'm not saying that we should go Republican. I'm saying we need to think about our relationship with the Democratic Party insofar as we give them our votes and ask for nothing in return. Um, because when black people are sick, Nancy Pelosi should be feeling some pain. And that does not look like a woman who feels pain to me because uh, black people are disproportionately jailed in her city and being kicked out of San Francisco. Um, so... That is one of the illusions that we fostered in black youth. They don't understand what it is to be black. And you didn't teach them what it meant to be black. Because honestly, a lot of black baby boomers themselves had a confused notion of what it meant to be black because the civil rights generation did a lot of heavy lifting to open up the window that allowed a lot of black teachers, black janitors, black parole officers, pretty much the black middle class to get those jobs. The civil rights generation, which is just a little bit older, opened up the window through black politics to change the odds so that what little money there is is in baby boomer's hands so that they would do okay. Because what little money is in the black community comes from those black postal workers, those black um, janitors, union janitors, union postal workers, um, government jobs, those black teachers, those black parole officers who work for 30 years. What little money is in the black community is in their hands, and their kids aren't doing that well. Uh, because honestly, you thought you could teach your kids how to be house Negroes, and it work out. When actually we needed black politics that stood toe to toe with white politics as equals, as equals and made appropriate demands. That's how you deal with white people, as equals, not as subservient, but with income and with wealth inequality being what it is, you can't stand toe to toe as equals because you need a white check. Because at $1,700, that is not enough to live in America without a white sponsor. Right? Without a white employer. That's not enough to start a business. And that's why you have this huge in Athens, you have a huge 501c3 um, uh, prof, um, complex that just doles out charity to a handful of Negroes as they see fit. That is not justice. That's living at white charity because we're so vulnerable, because put the number up there, just so people don't forget, we're so vulnerable. Uh, because we don't have access to wealth, and you need that $100,000 net worth in order to make moves in America, in order to grow. Because that $1,700 will never turn into real money. And as soon as you save, you save, you save, you save, your car is going to burn out. And when you're only making $7 an hour and you only have $1,700 net worth, when your transmission goes, you're back at zero. You just wasted a decade. Because that's not how money grows in America. It grows by access to real capital, right? And black people, we do not have access to real black capital because our politics shut us out. So insofar as you taught your children how to be house Negroes instead of black political organizers, you've set them up to be poor. I'll say that again. Insofar as you've taught your children to be house Negroes to think we sick, when master is sick, and when master is not sick, when you're sick, you've set them up to be poor. You've set them up. You didn't know better. You thought if you were just nice and paid attention and, and got them to be nice, that somehow they would be white. And that's just not how it works. You need a black politics that changes the odds and moves towards equality. And that means economic inclusion. Um, at the level of contracts, at the level of hiring managers, at the level of employee pay. There's no shame in being an employee. Being an employee is not a slave. Being an employee is being an employee. The problem is black people are shunted to occupations that they've normalized treating us like the working poor. White employees get two weeks of vacation. They get maternity leave. Why, it's OK. You can do very well as an employee. You don't have to own your, uh, own your own business. You just can't be 
uh, do very well as a black employee unless you're willing to be a house Negro with a certain pucker. There's not even enough room in America for, for, for an entire black generation of house Negroes because remember, there were always more field Negroes than there were house Negroes. So what your parents were setting you up, and black baby boomers, this is what you set your kid up to. You set your kid up with a lottery ticket. And now you're just surprised when the lottery didn't pay out for them. But that was never a strategy for, black, for a black middle class. A strategy for a black middle class was keeping the window that started to get open from the civil rights generation, keeping that open and demanding that Bill Clinton get black people jobs and that Barack Obama get black people jobs and getting that all of your, black, all of your white democratic politicians, insofar as we give them 95% of our votes, need to be talking about black jobs first. That's how you get the quality of black politics you need that would make sure that your kids would actually get included in the wealth generating um, economy that was produced. Um, I don't know, there should be some graphs on the USB at least on how everyone made money um, in America. Every demographic made money in America under Obama's presidency except black people. Now, largely, that's because a lot of what wealth we did have was tied up in housing. So when the housing asset bubble went down, a lot of our uh, wealth was tied to that. However, the bailout could have been restructured. The bailout could have been structured to preserve black housing equity. But instead, it was, preserved, it was structured to um, grow white 1% wealth, like wealthy white um, money. Could have been restructured. It wasn't restructured. There wasn't the authority, um, um, there wasn't the advocacy that we needed from our first black president to get the restructuring, to, to preserve what little wealth is in the black community in those homes done. So instead of black people getting, getting bailed out, a whole lot of non black people took, took it on the chin for America. And this isn't the first time that black people took it on the chin for America. Now, this same report will show that the top 22%, a lot of white people throughout the Obama presidency like broke even, but the top 22% uh, made money. And it, a lot, they made a lot of money. The top 22% made a lot of money through Obama's. And they had started out with more money, and the top 22% made more money. And honestly, that's only, that's one out of every four to five. So, like, even if you did fine, even if you wrote it out and didn't make any, turns out that your white uncle, your white cousins, they made money for, through Obama. So, like, the money still stays in, 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 in the family, um, in the clan. It might take someone dying for you to see it, but your poverty isn't black poverty. Whereas the only people who made money for Obama is uh, the top 1% um, of black people, if you found the... Uh, the, the yeah, um, there's a graph. Look under um, Crater, Obama. Um, no, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be on the USB, but it's also going to be um, on the internet. Just, find Crater Obama economy, and, and it'll show you the, the graph. The people who made money in the Obama economy is um, that top 1% of black people, that black people who are net worth are 1.4 million and above. Now, zero, now the top, I said the top 28, 22% of white people made money through Obama, um, but like 98, I want to make sure I get this right. The percentile of black Americans who lost money, cratered, saw their wealth just go away, was from the um, 75th percentile to the 98th percentile. They lost a ton of money, while the 99th percentile made black people lost money. White people, like that, the curve, they, the, the, the top 22% made money. Black people, if you, were in, if you were not the 99th, if you were just the 98th, you still lost money. Um, crater is the, is the word you're looking for, uh, with a C. So um, what that means was his presidency wasn't about us. It was, and while other people got money, we got family photos and the idea that 
somehow having a black president means anything about black communities' wealth. What we got is a lot of poverty, and what we got is actually a lot of confusion. Um, and that's because we did not expect our first black president to advocate for a black middle class. And that class is about wealth and access to wealth. We did not expect our first black president to actually redress the generations long um, terrorism that's locked us out of wealth. All right, so we're gonna forget the graph and we're gonna go to a different, um, I got, I'll take control. All right, so there's, I'm gonna show you a clip from someone who's coming next week someone who actually gets what it means to grow a black middle class and what we need. This is a clip from um, Mersha um, Baradin, Baradin, and she just came out with a wonderful book called The Color of Wealth. All of you people who wrote, who read The New Jim Crow, or even bought The New Jim Crow, but because it's a lot of book, didn't quite read it, you should actually read The Color of Wealth because that's what gets. That's a little book just came out, I want to say about a month ago, that, that's what gets um, why we don't have a black middle class, and that's what gets how we've been fooled into thinking that either black banking or black capitalism was going to create what a white government did for the white middle class. Here is Moshe Bard, um, Bardon. Yes, to, to really understand that we have a racial divide, and um, a lot of that is rooted in history, a history that we have yet to confront, um, we need to confront that history. And, and on the policy aspect, the way to close the wealth gap, we know how to do it because we've done it for white Americans. We did it after the Great Depression. We know how to do it. It's a mixed economy, banks, government. You, you know, secure mortgages. You make them risk-free. We did it. It didn't cost very much money. It actually increased money, right? We just have refused to do it for black communities. And so if we're going to talk about it, we've got to talk about it in a way that is um, federal, large and that targets the problem, which is segregation, concentrated poverty, all of that stuff. And, and it, but it takes looking at the history in an honest way instead of saying, oh, well, Martin Luther King gave the speech, and now we aren't going to judge people by the color of their skin. And so, good, we're over. And you know, it's like the John Roberts rewriting. He says the way to stop racial discrimination is to stop discriminating based on race. And what he meant was we are now colorblind. And what we realized is we're actually not colorblind. We've never been colorblind. So we have to see color again and look at it in a way that is, recognizes the history of color. We have to, to really understand. So there was Mersha Baradon saying what Barack Obama should have said if he actually wanted to create a black middle class. But he said what he wanted to say because he wanted to be president. And you fell for it because you wanted him to be president. And now your kids live with you. I'll say that again. Barack Obama should have said there is a black America and there's a white America, and we need to make the black America whole. Um, and that means economically included in the wealth generation powers that white America controls. And that's what we should do as a matter of justice. That's what he should have said if he actually wanted to advocate and actually use that podium to publicly educate America on race. But he wanted to be president. And so we decided that his aspirations, his individual aspirations, have been for the last 10 years more important than building a black middle class. It's his individual aspirations were more important than your kids, is what, is what that vote meant. By letting him off the hook, by allowing him to say that, like, when white America's sick, we sick. That, those were the stakes. Ten years gone. Ten years gone. I hope it was worth it. That's where we made a mistake. That's where we took our, took our eye off the political ball. And, and that's why we're in the situation we're in right now. And I hope this has been illuminating. I, we're going to take some audience questions. Or if uh, uh, someone wants to read something from YouTube that's been popping off, um, we'll take that. I'm, the, the, next week, next week, like I said, we keep moving. Black people are always moving. My mom moved from South Carolina to California to get away from white terrorism. Now, like, I've been priced out of California, so, like, I moved back to Georgia. We're always just moving. 
we can't build when we move. And, and then, like, we're, like, in this studio, we've moved just because, like, the person who rents us the spot wouldn't even take money for the spot. I was like, look, I need the spot. I can pay you rent. But we're so vulnerable as a people um, that the person I was renting from is so vulnerable insofar as they're, they're worried about, like, scaring away their white check. Um, uh, that they wouldn't even rent the spot. So those people who say that like money is a great equalizer, no, I can't even pay. We can't even pay to do black politics. I can't get, I can't get someone to take my money so that I can do black politics. That's why we're going to end up needing to buy a spot. So, um, so if you actually have access to $100,000 so I can just buy a studio uh, in the middle of black Athens, that'd be great. Send me an email at irony at thefunkyacademic.com and we will talk, and we will get you a black middle class. And look, when I say if you just have $100,000 so I can buy a studio, you're white. All right, so like, this is a great way to assuage your guilt. And you should feel guilty, because the reason you have $100,000 is one of the reasons that like, I have to keep moving. Because, um, because money is tied to accommodating white feelings, and justice is tied to making demands on white feelings. So like, I'm not gonna accommodate your feelings. I will give you justice insofar as I will help create a black middle class, which means taking your $100,000 and putting it to good use, creating a black middle class. Um, How are you doing? Hey, sister. Um, so if you have $100,000, email me. Um, if not, and you just wanna make a big donation to this show so I can keep this going, because all of this costs money. And because uh, I, I, I want to pay the person I'm using the space right now a little bit of rent. Um, all this costs money. Go to the Funky Academic, sign up for a monthly. Next week, I'm, I'm talking with Mercer Baradan. The week after that, we're going to do um, black labor and the union movement and why the right to work is actually racialized um, and why the reason why we don't have more better black unions and jobs in the South um, is actually, there's a racial story. So in two weeks, I'm going to do that story. We're going to, and because at the end of this, the quality of political education I'm going to give you is going to be pro-black worker. It's going to get black unions with black people making good black wages, which means $25, $28, $32 an hour. Those are the kind of wages we deserve for doing the work that we already do instead of six, seven, nine dollars an hour. And then being happy when we make 12 you can't build off 12. Um, and to a lot of black people who are watching this, $12 an hour sounds like a lot of money. That's still not enough money for us. That's not enough money for the wealth that we were locked out of. And that's not enough money as recompense for the, for the anxiety that is just being black in America. There's a lot of anguish. We, we, I need to be made whole. And that comes with a check. Preferably just make that check out to cash. <laughs> make it out to cash. Um, so go to the Funky Academic. Give. Because this idea that we can get justice while still accommodating white fragility. And if you don't know, white fragility is just a term that was coined by uh, Robin DiAngelo in a piece called White Fragility. And that just means that the anxiety that white people feel when they have to deal with race-based issues. So because they feel this anxiety, we have to, or feel called to, we don't have to do anything. We feel called, we have to if we want money, but like if... Um, we feel called to try to accommodate that anxiety by not being honest about um, the justice claims due to black people. So when Obama says there is no black America, there is no white America, he was accommodating himself to white fragility at the expense of black America, who nudes people who say that there is a black America and there is a white America. One, black, one America is worth $1,700, the other America is worth $100,000, and the other America is worth $100,000 because of the exploitation of the black America that was worth $1,700. So that's what we're doing. That's, that's the story of why your kids aren't broke, because you didn't teach them how to be black. You didn't teach them that being black meant advocating for black people, doing black politics. And you didn't teach them that being black means teaching white people how to treat us. Because we will not get justice until we treat, teach white people how to treat us. You think, you, well, you know, if we just put our pennies together, and then if you just give me $5, and I'll, if you get $5, all of a sudden we can compete with Amazon. No, that's not how this works. No, putting black pennies together will never get you to compete with Amazon. 
what will get you to compete with Amazon is a federal authority that says, Bezos, we need to talk. Either 20% uh, of your employees are black or we're going to have to cut you up like we did Ma Bell. That will get real money into Amazon um, or unionizing Amazon's black employees. Like that will get real money into to the black communities. So think we can, thinking we can do it without teaching white people how to treat us is an illusion. We need justice and we need to demand it. Or we need to tell Nancy Pelosi that we will shut it down. We need to tell the Democrats that if they don't learn how to treat us the way we ought to be treated by right, we will shut down the Democratic Party. Because we're used to being poor. It's you guys who will go around like freaking out. Oh, Trump. Nah, we've been there. Um, we will shut it down. Or you can just give us the jobs at fair rates. That's all. So I'm going to open it up first to the audience. We have a live studio audience. I want to hear some live audience feedback. Um, anybody? Should we go straight to YouTube? Yeah, just go to the microphone. Yeah, to the microphone. Um, the microphone should be really close to you, on you. Yeah. Let's go to the microphone. And yeah, yeah, that one. Keep going. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Hey. Look at that. The system's working. Sorry. All right. Hey. Um, up, so I guess just starting from home, starting yeah. from Athens, what can uh, UGA students that are not you know, from Athens, how can we uh, contribute and help ameliorate um, the generational poverty that yes. is Athens? All right. So what you can do as just a regular student is if you're involved in any political group, that means like the Young Democrats, or I think Athens for Everyone has a UGA campus, uh, UGA, uh, you got to get them talking about what are we doing in this city? How are we advocating for black people to get middle class jobs? There's construction happening all over the city, and there will be construction happening um, all over the city for the next 40 years, I think. There will be construction happening. Those are good jobs. Those are good jobs that black Athens people can be doing. And that's the same if, if, look, if it works here, it'll also work in Columbia at the University of South Carolina. It'll also work in Richmond, the University of Richmond, and, uh, or what's the other school in Richmond? Uh, UV, Virginia Tech, UVA? University of Richmond. University of Richmond. Virginia, there's a university, large university in Richmond. VCU. It's v Virginia Commonwealth. Okay, then it's, then VCU. Um, uh, it could work there because Richmond is another city with a lot of money, a lot of old money, a lot of money that was built on the exploitation of black people that does not go to black people. It's got, what's up? Tobacco. It's got that tobacco money. And it, it wasn't white people mm. like making, making that tobacco, like, like plucking that tobacco. <laughs> so like that tobacco and cotton money, that should be, it's got a huge black population and a huge black poverty population. We need everyone who cares about any sort of justice to care about redistributing the jobs in those cities to black people. So if you're involved in any campus organization, ask what your campus organization is to make sure that contracts and contractors that the university uses mm -hmm. use black people and then pay black people the same rates they would have paid the white contractors. So that should be an advocacy. Uh, we'll talk after this, and we'll talk about how to strategize a little bit more concretely around that. But it can be done. It can be done, but right now it's not even on the radar. Um, what do we do to get black people the jobs that do exist? Because in a city like Athens, city like Richmond, city like Columbia, there are jobs that exist and are constantly be created. The problem is they go through networks, and then those, the people who live in those networks actually live in suburbs, like in Watkinsville, the Winder. And so like, it ends up being a colonial relationship where people drive in from the suburbs to Athens get some of the money that's generated in Athens and then drive back out and pay taxes out there. Um, and we have enough money that's generated in Athens to create a black middle class if we put political pressure to redistribute the income. Okay. So yeah, okay. I hope that helps. It's yeah, just making, putting it on the, on, letting it be known that this is something we can do politically yeah. through political organizing. Look, the King March was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. Right? People don't forget that. It was a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. When he was killed, he was killed working for sanitation workers, thinking these sanitation workers, the workers who pick up your poop, need um, to get paid the quality of like, income that like, a white plumber gets paid. Like, 
He was worrying about jobs because if you don't have economic inclusion, then one, you're food for white capitalists. You don't even have a uh, economic or political defense. Mm -hmm. That means when um, someone wants your spot, they can either just take it or just bribe you out of it. Mm -hmm. Like how much black community can you have if like all the money you can get together can't even keep a community center open because as soon as some real, real white money actually writes a check for $5 million, like your five hundred thousand dollars just isn't going to do it, and yeah. the, the the owner is going to sell it to the person with five million dollars. So you don't even if you don't have economic equality, you don't have political equality. You can't even protect your community resources because someone will either pressure you out with cops or just like spend more money and get what it, because like they have access to money and resources you don't have. So we need political power, and then political power buttressed by economic power, and political power that's trained on getting economic power. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Next person. How to donate. All right. So thank you. You can donate by going to thefunkyacademic.com. And there's a panel on the left. It used to be on the right. Now it's on the left. Um, there's a panel on the left that, and that's mirrored because of the camera, but like you'll get it. Panel on the left that says donate or um, become a monthly subscriber. I like the monthly subscribers, so you should do both. You should donate a lot of money um, so that we could kick up production values and I can pay Matthew the intern a little bit more. And, 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 and then you should also set up for a monthly. And then also tell your friends to donate and set up for a monthly, because this is the kind of political education we need broadcasted everywhere, because this isn't just, it's localized to Athens, so I'm going to talk about Athens issues, but I'm going to try to do it in a way that actually works and it's portable to everywhere. There's a poor black population and a population with white money, which is a lot of places in these United States. Uh, next question from the audience. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, again, thank you for doing this political education. Uh, so my question is actually a two-part question. Um, so on the arc of uh, black political justice, you know, where does the Kaepernick movement uh, stand as well as, you know, there are a lot of local elections getting ready to come up um, and, and a lot of, uh, you know, just political, um, you know, elections coming up. So uh, what should, you know, African-Americans be talking to these uh, candidates uh, about? Can you kind of reiterate that and explain that? Yeah, good. All right. So there are two, uh, two different, two distinct questions. One on the Kaepernick issue. Um, Kaepernick was about like, Kaepernick knelt because America wasn't making black people whole. It was terrorizing us in the streets and locking us out of um, civil society. So don't make this about free speech. Anybody who tries to make it about free speech, say no. Kaepernick was talking about justice for black people. You can talk about free speech somewhere else, but if you're going to kneel, we're going to kneel for black, justice for black people because this is about black people. This is a black people issue. So like, don't just make it about kneeling as a matter of expressing yourself. Like, you can express yourself, but I want you to express yourself in a way that gets justice for black people and is about getting justice for black people. And white people, our claims aren't particular to black people. They're justice claims, and they're American justice claims. So this is an American political education. The reason you haven't gotten this political education before in your schools is because your curriculum is not about American history. Your curriculum is about accommodating white fragility. And so like, I'm just giving you the American history that you need in order so that you don't have a distorted view of reality, so that you know that you, that, that how to make good on justice claims and American justice claims. Also, he mentioned local elections. Local elections are coming up. This is the first time where you can kind of test run. You can give a kind of a test, test drive how to ask politicians to create black jobs. And that's, what, that's your job. Your job, white people, black people, that's, that's your job if you care about American justice. You need to talk to anyone who's running for anything. So what are you gonna do to create black middle class jobs? What are you gonna do to um, increase home ownership in the black community? No, really, what are you gonna do to create black middle class jobs? And don't let them say, well, there's a nonprofit. No, I'm talking about government sponsored pipelines with government authority and that with government accountability. Pipelines from third grade to high school principal. You want to be a high school principal? You're seven years old. We're going to make that happen. We're going to force open a pipeline that gets you there. Um, and those are the quality of pipelines we need. We need pipelines to management. 
We need black managers. We need pipelines to get black contractors. That means we need the black people to work in those point of entry jobs, you know, swinging a hammer. So I need you to fight for black people working those point of entry jobs. So then, once they get um, experience, they can um, become contractors. And then I need you also to pay for their accountants and, and, and to get them services so that they can put together a bid. Also, we need a political backstop for the capitalization requirements to become a contractor because in order to become a contractor, it's easy to have. You need access to like $50,000 in credit and a million dollar insurance policy. Now, black people, if you go to your, uh, your bank or a state farm and you say like, well, you know, I got, I got a little bit of money here and I got a little bit of money coming in and, and you know, I got, I, got, I, got, I got my tax return coming in. Can I, can I, can I get a million dollar policy based on that? That's not gonna work. You know who gets a million dollar policy? The person who can go to their white church not black church, white church, because the white church is surrounded by other white people who have access to that $100,000 and say that, like, look, I need to raise $30,000 so that I can get insured um, um, and pay for the license and bonding. That's how you make moves in America, and that's how you leverage networks. And your network is the people who went to your wedding and black people. We're not even getting married. So, like... So, so that's the talk about um, the, the just we're locked out of capital, and that's the problem, and that's what we need political advocacy for. So all of these things that were done that white people can now do internally, the New Deal did for them. So we need a New Deal for black America that actually does those things for us. And that's what I'm going to talk about with Baradan um, next week. And... Uh, yeah, is there anything provocative on YouTube or is anyone yeah, have a question? Positive pipelines to replace the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, we just need, we need, there's a school to prison pipeline. We need a different pipeline. We need a positive pipeline that's school to union contractor pipeline, that's school to principal pipeline, that's school to hiring manager pipeline. And we need it all worked out. Just don't tell us to go to, go to more school and come out with more degrees. No, I need a pipeline that guarantees a job at the end. I need, while I'm getting a degree, I need not loans, but a grant. Um, that's backstopped by the state, not like by white charity, because black justice should not be at the whims of white charity. So anyone who tells you about like seeking a, uh, a charity with a white donor board as the, 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 the source of your justice, no, the best thing a charity with a white donor board can do is give money to this program right here so we can advocate for um, real redress, which will come from organizing uh, for state power with real dollars uh, that'll get, create the quality of pipelines we need. All right, YouTube or anybody else in the audience? Audience questions. There's a reason why we have a live show. All right, how, how long are we running? I want to keep this about an hour. Um, yeah, we're hour and 12 minutes. Hour and 12 minutes? All right, that's enough. All right, next week, it's Mersha Baradan. And I'm going to leave you once again with the clip um, so you know what we're working with. We have a racial divide, and um, a lot of that is rooted in history, a history that we have yet to confront. Um, we need to confront that history, and, and on the policy aspect, the way to close the wealth gap, we know how to do it because we've done it for white Americans. We did it after the Great Depression. We know how to do it. It's a mixed economy, banks, government. You, you know, secure mortgages. You make them risk-free. We did it. It didn't cost very much money. It actually increased money, right? We just have refused to do it for black communities. And so if we're going to talk about it, we've got to talk about it in a way that is um, federal, large, and that targets the problem, which is segregation, concentrated poverty, all of that stuff. And, and it, but it takes looking at the history in an honest way instead of saying, oh, well, Martin Luther King gave the speech, and now we aren't going to judge people by the color of their skin. And so, good, we're over. And, you know, it's like the John Roberts rewriting. So that's Mersha Baradon. She's coming next week. Her book, The Color of Money, is... Um, it's, 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 so, it's, it's a really wonderful read. Everyone who read The New Jim Crow or thought about reading The Jim, New Jim Crow should actually read Baradon's book. It's called The Color of Money. It just came out. I'll see you guys next week, and thanks for the show. All right. Check us out.